in this episode, I have my friend Wayne Jett as a guest, and he's kind of agreed to do a series around his book, The Fruits of Graft, Great Depressions Then and Now. So we've kind of gone uh, historically, we've laid some groundwork in context prior to the Great Depression, which his book covers thoroughly. And then we're going to continue through the Great Depression, hopefully, and in, in possibly even coming up to date. Here, this is 2020, April. Um, and today, you know, we discussed kind of classical economics, mercantilism and classical economics, and gone kind of up to the Great Depression. But um, Wayne Jett is trained as an engineer and as an attorney, has argued before the Supreme Court. He is an authority on classical economics, and he's an incredible author. And the book, The Fruits of Graph, Great Depressions Then and Now, is really um, a, a hallmark work on the Great Depression. And it tells, in my opinion, the truth, and the other side of what really happened in the Great Depression. It's hard to find this information all in one place, so I would encourage you to get your copy. And uh, thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoy. I know we had fun, so thank you. So welcome to the Banking with Life podcast. I'm your host, James Nethery, and I'm as pleased as I can be to have a returning guest, Mr. Wayne Jett. And, uh, and, and kind of the, the background here is I reached out to him and asked him if he would consider doing a series um, of the Great Depression and economics of his work. And so that's he, he graciously agreed to do so. And so this will be really the first of several um, episodes. And, and we kind of agreed. Or, and it's kind of not a hard outline, okay, um, but his work, The Fruits of Graph, which everyone should read, and, and it'll be linked in the notes below how to obtain your copy, and you should purchase this book and read it. This, this series, and, and really all of the interviews that I'm aware of that he has graciously done on the internet, YouTube, none of it is a replacement for the, for the reading of his book. Okay, I just wanna make that clear. But we, we've kind of discussed that we would uh, maybe go kind of get a, a prelude kind of maybe before the Great Depression, through the Great Depression, and even afterwards. Is that is that about right, Wayne? I think that's right. I, I might say that uh, what you're saying about reading uh, the book, it's not really a, a, you know, just a plain out promotional type thing and wanting to sell a book. The fact of the matter is that uh, uh, for my capabilities, um, it uh, was much uh, more within my powers and capacity uh, to, to research and to write and to put it down on paper over a period of six or seven years to do so and edit it down to the bare minimum uh, than it is for me to remember all of that and speak about it uh, within 30 or 45 minutes on on uh, a television or, or a YouTube uh, type of presentation. I do my best and I, I try to provide as much uh, useful uh, understanding as I can in these discussions. But uh, the written word is gonna be the record as best I can make it, uh, you know, for uh, the extent they uh, decide to use it for posterity. Uh, but it's for you right now. It's for everyone right now. And uh, I assure you, if uh, it was available in any other book, I would not have spent the time to write it. Uh, I don't need to duplicate other things. I, I certainly didn't do it to produce income. Uh, it was uh, uh, just a matter of my circumstances of, of previous uh, success as, as a lawyer that enabled me to support myself and my family uh, during the time it took to get into this thing. Uh, once I had... Uh, uh, to some extent, I regarded the time as making them made the mistake of sticking my nose into <laughs> some historical records uh, because I just couldn't uh, put myself off any longer. I had actually uh, uh, refrained from doing it, but uh, I had an idea. I had learned that the the uh, personal daily diary of the man who 
served Roosevelt as his, uh, Franklin Roosevelt as his treasury secretary for every year, but the first year uh, that he, that Roosevelt was in office, that man, uh, Henry Morgenthau Jr. had uh, made a personal diary and they, they were edited with uh, Morgenthau's help by a Yale historian and uh, put into a multi-volume work of all these uh, daily diaries. And I thought, well, if there's any place that uh, they might divulge something worthwhile to know about what was really going on during the Great Depression, that, that would be the place. But I actually put it off. I didn't want to stick my nose into it, but I finally decided <clears throat> I, I can't ignore it. I better look. And by that time, I had learned enough about uh, classical economic analysis uh, to think I knew where to look or what to look for. And so I started that, and that's uh, how I got my nose in deeply enough that uh, I decided uh, finally that I, I actually had to start putting pen to paper and uh, uh, or typewriter to whatever you want to call it and do something about reporting this stuff because it had not been reported. The man I was working with at the time, this was back in uh, the early uh, 2000s, 2004, 2005 and so forth, uh, was Jude Winiski, who uh, had written a book that was important in the 20th century back in 78 uh, that uh, he regarded as being the definitive work on uh, why, uh, why we had the great crash of 29. Uh, but he was clear in his own research and his own thinking, uh, which was quite substantial. He, he was a, a very capable man and what he called and named supply side economics. Uh, I call it classical economic theory because it's, it's very much, uh, I think, the same uh, viewpoint. But uh, his, his view was that nobody had explained the Great Depression. Uh, not uh, John Kenneth Galbraith and his giant work about the, the crash of 29 or anything else, and not Milton Friedman, not anybody else, uh, had said this is why we had the Great Depression. And uh, uh, in fact, the, uh, the economists of the day had gone to the point of saying it's just too complicated, we can't understand it, and nobody else can understand it either. Well, I guarantee you, uh, it is very understandable when you identify the acts that were taken in secret uh, and uh, without explanation to the public. Some of it was apparent to the public, but uh, most of it was not. And so I'd like to go into some of that this morning. And uh, uh, again, uh, I do it, do it much more definitively uh, in my book. Uh, in fact, it's about a half a chapter. Uh, Chapter six of my book uh, identifies the actions taken by Hoover and by FDR to impose the Great Depression on the American people and the world and to make it into an imposed genocide that starved to death uh, millions of people, millions of Americans, mm -hmm. uh, not just people in foreign lands, although I'm sure there were many of those as well. Uh, so. Uh, as far as our discussion this morning, uh, what I uh, think uh, would be useful to do is to start uh, with a, a general discussion of mercantilism, which was the economic system in effect uh, in the early years, a thousand years ago, all the way up to the time that capitalism supposedly uh, made its, or actually did make its appearance uh, largely about the time the, uh, the Battle of Waterloo ended. But uh, early 1800s, uh, late uh, 1700s, the revolution and so forth, and the uh, beginning of the, the building of the New World, the independent nation of America, uh, those were the times when capitalism was, were making their influence uh, the capitalists who were the working people, uh, what uh, really is uh, classically known as the middle class. Uh, we want to understand that the middle class is all of those people 
uh, at whatever income level capable of supporting themselves at the level of standard of living that they are, are able to produce. They include working rich people uh, who've done very well, uh, but who uh, have done very well by their work and by their production and by selling goods and services uh, to others in such a way that uh, they are very profitable, they make, they're very wealthy, but they, they produce in order to consume. Uh, that is the middle class. It goes all the way down to the uh, person who labors on a, on a small farm or uh, on any other way, uh, a garden or whatever, in order to support his family or her family. Uh, that's the middle class. Um, and it is called the middle class because it came up in the middle of what was traditionally in effect in the world. That was a, a system of rulers and uh, servants or slaves. Uh, that was the two class system. Uh, the middle class came up in between that uh, when individuals were able by some uh, stretch of imagination and energy on their part. They were able to uh, bring themselves above the level of uh, the mere servant, uh, the person who could simply be extinguished uh, and gotten out of the way because he was uh, getting too big for his riches or something of the sort. Um, there's a, uh, a, a historic case that arose in the uh, in the colonial days of America, uh, in the uh, dominion from the Dutch uh, in America called uh, New Amsterdam or New York. Uh, it, that was developed, it was not a British colony, uh, but it was developed uh, in the uh, uh, special way that the, that the Dutch monarchy had of um, creating great baronies. Uh, the way they did it uh, is they staked out their claim in the New York, Manhattan area. And then around that, uh, they developed two major river systems. Uh, one was the Hudson. The other was the East-West River, river that uh, escaped my name right at this uh, moment. Uh, but um, the way they developed those properties is they uh, they granted large tracts of land to barons, in other words, the people who supported the king. Uh, that's the whole point of mercantilism. It was a system of what I call kingmakers, in which uh, powerful people with uh, the resources to put up uh, fighting men and armies and so forth to support a king and put him on the throne uh, would then use the king uh, to uh, enhance their own fortunes, their own power. And that was what was going on here. The king was paying back some of those uh, barons, the ones who supported the king and put them on the throne uh, uh, in Europe. Uh, by awarding them large tracts of land. The way they did it is develop these two river basins in New York. And the way they did it is uh, they would grant uh, land uh, at your choice, either to the Baron, either on uh, both sides of the river bank or on only one side, if you chose to be on only one side. Uh, if you uh, chose only one side, you got 16 miles of riverfront uh, and uh, the land from that river all the way up to the top of the mountain peak uh, uh, on that side of the river. If you chose to have land on both sides of the river, uh, you got eight miles of riverfront uh, on the river and you got the land going up to the peaks on both sides of that river valley all the way to the top of the peaks. So you can see these were very large land holdings, very substantial places uh, that would amount to uh, a barony, certainly in England or France. It would be uh, like a kingdom, uh, practically. And those barons were given complete authority 
to run their property and and the social activity and the working productive activity on it as they saw fit. So they were all all powerful. Uh, there was a, a historic instance in which a man working on one of those baronies uh, decided that uh, the working people there ought to have some rights. And he began organizing or talking with others uh, to encourage that kind of thing as if uh, we ought to have some kind of you know, collective so that we can get better working conditions uh, uh, and some better, better pay, a better life for our families and so forth. He was hanged at the order of the baron. So the, uh, and, and it certainly was uh, made well known so that uh, that kind of thing uh, obviously was to be discouraged. Uh, but that was the nature of uh, the economic system. Uh, the barons uh, made much more money by working people at subsistence wages and uh, exploiting their powers with the king, uh, influence with the king in order to enhance their own powers and influence. Uh, that was mercantilism. And uh, uh, the system of king makers that uh, uh, existed for, uh, well, it at least did, uh, it was, uh, uh, it was in effect at least a thousand years ago uh, and uh, undoubtedly was in some form prior to that, whether they call it that or not. But they call it mercantilism because it makes it sound as if uh, they're merchants. Right. It makes people think of, of uh, business people and so forth. But it was kingmakers. And uh, uh, that is basically uh, uh, the nature of the beast that we're talking about. Um, and uh, there were various aspects of it, uh, particularly from the standpoint of uh, the time when greater prosperity began. Uh, we're talking, uh, let's talk around 1600 or so. Uh, there was a very historic case that uh, started out innocently enough, you'd think, uh, in a uh, discussion uh, between young law students in uh, Glasgow, uh, Scotland, uh, west coast of Scotland. Uh, they were in law school and uh, there was some discussion amongst students as to tossing ideas back and forth. And uh, one of the law students uh, raised a question for consideration in the in the personal discussion about the ideas of how things worked, and uh, uh, that that discussion was reported by his, one of his uh, other students who had heard him. Uh, that other student regarded himself as having an obligation to report this comment uh, because it uh, was interpreted by the churchmen of the time as. These the things were subject to heresy charges, and heresy was uh, a not just a criminal offense; it was a capital offense. And uh, sure enough, he reported this to the law school uh, authorities. Uh, he was brought up on charges. He was tried for heresy, uh, sentenced to death. Um, young law student, uh, and. Uh, it became a case of some no, uh, notoriety and went all the way up through the Supreme Court and then went to the king uh, for uh, a final decision and the man, young man was hanged. Now that was uh, in early 1600s and so when you think about such things uh, 175 years maybe 150 years, something like that, later. Uh, when Adam Smith was writing about the, the wealth of nations, uh, why would he use a, uh, a mythical term such as an invisible hand uh, to uh, describe how uh, good things happen when people get to work and make a profit? Uh, that's the kind of thing uh, that 
result in the kinds of terminology, I think, uh, when Adam Smith is writing, uh, I can assure you the hanging of that young law student uh, after appeals to the highest realms and the highest churches and highest the kingly authority uh, and, uh, and you sacrifice a young life that way, uh, it strikes the fear into academicians and uh, into uh, business uh, people at any level. And uh, that is a part of mercantilism. Uh, and uh, uh, my description, as I say, of the being kingmakers. So you put all of that in the context. Uh, mercantilism was a system that enabled those powerful people around the king to very, be very profitable, to be very wealthy, to be very powerful, and for ordinary people to be commoners to be their servants, to be their workers, nothing more. Uh, but uh, with the writings and uh, reportings of the, uh, sometimes through ideas of college professors, uh, the ideas of uh, uh, how to become more prosperous, the ideas about political rights, and the fighting that had to go on in order to uh, get the Magna Carta and the rights of man and uh, things of that sort. All of that became a part of the political milieu that connected in with the economic financial system of mercantilism. And yes, it had some influences. It began to have some influences in the teachings of how to be more prosperous, how to have a more powerful country. It started appealing to the kings uh, as to, we can have a more powerful country if we understand the economy better and make it even more powerful and we have a, a more general participation in that by our, our uh, populace. And so after Adam Smith, that book uh, called uh, The Wealth of Nations uh, became influential in the uh, parliaments that operated uh, under the king and so forth. And uh, they uh, continued to uh, make some progress in that regard. Uh, that is the basis upon which the middle class actually started growing, started prospering, started having something in the way of a so-called political rights that they could depend upon and, uh, and get some collective influence on the king uh, to let them uh, develop uh, um, more uh, e efficiently. And uh, lo and behold, we then start having uh, what uh, Karl Marx, no less, uh, called in 1850, uh, he said something basically like, uh, uh, within scarcely 150 years, uh, uh, the capitalists have, have achieved more things in terms of innovations and in technology and in production and in, in prosperity in 150 years than all previous centuries put together. And uh, so, uh, as of 1850, there was already a miraculous change in the way the economy functioned because of this middle class and their, uh, their operations. Um, nevertheless, even with that, I would hasten to add uh, that uh, uh, capitalism did not uh, take control of the world. Right. Uh, it was an active force to be sure, but mercantilism did not disappear. Uh, in fact, I would uh, like to advance the, the, the notion that uh, what we call crony capitalism today is mercantilism mercantilism alive and not well, but powerful in the United States of America. Uh, that is the establishment and so forth. Uh, high, I would say high taxes, high tariffs, big government projects, and the modern version of crony capitalism is 
Exactly. Well, I'll tell you, uh, the centerpiece of uh, mercantilism in the United States today, as it has been since our founding, is uh, essentially Wall Street, uh, the financial sector, the big banks that are still owned by the mercantilists of uh, Europe yeah. and the rest of the world. Uh, they exercise tremendous power and influence, uh, not just in our business sector by any means, but over our government. Uh, they are kindly called the establishment, uh, both in both political parties. They control both political parties. Uh, they do not have differences in political opinions. They are mercantilists uh, that use government power and control in order to put additional power and wealth in their pockets uh, and to assure that uh, their power is ever increasing, uh, not on the wane. Uh, it has not been. Uh, and uh, the more we're told that it doesn't exist, uh, the more effective you can be sure their control is, especially over our so-called free press, uh, over our politicians and so forth. But uh, I, I won't go into it at this point, but uh, I believe that we have, as I've said uh, many times before, that we have uh, almost uh, beyond belief that we have presently the first uh, time in history a real counter assault by the uh, middle class against the ruling elite, against, against the globalist cabal that announced back in 1901 uh, that uh, they had to and intended to completely destroy the middle class, including extinguishing uh, the members of the middle class, uh, exterminating them. Uh, by the end of, uh, by the year 2000 or thereabouts, at least they had as their stated goal that uh, they wanted to be able to have the capability of poisoning all of the people they did not want to live uh, by the year 2000. Uh, but uh, they certainly arranged other events of the 20th century, uh, the wars, uh, the, uh, certainly the Great Depression, the, the flu of 1918, so-called. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, the COVID-19 thing is uh, another one of those works. Uh, but uh, let's, let's say back in the time of uh, developing the mercantilism ideas, uh, I could uh, spend a little more time on that or I can go ahead and uh, start talking about uh, uh, classical economic theory, depending, I'm not sure how far we've gone so far, but you tell me. Yeah, we, um, let me see here. We're at about 26 minutes. I would think that uh, that's a pretty good, I mean, we can talk about mercantilism as long as you would like. But um, if we if we go up to 1901, I think we should back up and, and either either we should continue, you should continue talking about mercantilism or you should bring in classical economics and then, and then go well, Let up. me add one more thing about mercantilism. Okay. One of the things that really assisted the middle class and it's a tremendous growth, uh, you know, starting uh, 1800 and, and uh, next 150 years was uh, a gold standard for currency. And uh, again, uh, that was uh, developed not so much uh, for the use of common people. It was developed for uh, as instruments for the king and for the king makers. Uh, it was a uh, set of standards uh, agreed to among the kings and various nations uh, to set their currency according to weight in gold. And uh, when one country sold goods to another and got their currency, it was to be currency that was exchangeable for gold. And essentially the way it worked is that at the end of every year, uh, each country would deliver up, if it had uh, um, bought more from that country and had uh, uh, more currency, uh, then it would exchange that currency back and get the gold. Uh, 
and uh, the other current uh, the country would do the same thing uh, and they would look at the two amounts of currency and if there was a net amount of gold to be shipped between the countries in order to, uh, to level things up and to make it even Stephen again then the country that was uh, owed, that owed the gold had to deliver it to the other country uh, that was essentially the way it worked and uh, obviously it made it uh, very desirable for each king to uh, have its country produce as much as possible and sell as much to the other country so that he didn't have to ship gold to the other country um, and they had a, a, an additional agreement that was very important on that that uh, if a country actually had a net inflow of gold in a particular year he was required or that king was required to monetize that gold in other words issue currency paper currency into its economy to its people so that those people would have more of that money to buy from the other country and uh, let that country have a better chance of getting its gold back yeah. uh, so uh, with that kind of mechanism it became a very powerful stimulant all countries wanting to trade with the other countries and so each country became more prosperous by doing so and uh, the gold standard contributed greatly to the elevation in the uh, earning power of the middle class uh, and uh, that is why the middle class became you know came from practically nothing to a real uh, force in the world that was being noted by scholars and so forth so anyway that we'll, we'll sort of say that uh, that's uh, sort of the uh, nutshell version of mercantilism and uh, so let's go uh, to the additional force that was happening at the same time of that 150 years of success perfect uh, there was the growth of the middle class and these ideas that were growing with the middle class some from academia about uh, what kind of economic policies would a country uh, adopt in order to make things better for its economy and the chance that its country was going to earn more gold from others than it had to give up. And uh, those things started catching on places like England, uh, France, and so forth. Uh, and um, they became known as classical economic theory. Some of them uh, came from wealth of nations, uh, not entirely by any means, but uh, their uh, basic thoughts and rules uh, that seem to be uh, common sense. And uh, But once the common sense is stated and is properly stated without the chance of being hanged, uh, then things started uh, looking up. And, uh, for example, uh, one of the uh, simple uh, ideas that came to the fore is that uh, it's known as, actually it's known as Say's Law, uh, after a man by the name of J.B. Say, but uh, it's a very straightforward thing. A person must produce before he consumes. Uh, that is, if you want to eat, you have to first get something to eat. It's as simple as that. Uh, and it works right across the board so far as uh, a business, an enterprise, uh, a, a chance to do something that other people need that will give you a, a broader chance to produce more so that you not only have enough to actually put on the table at dinner time or at breakfast, but you actually have enough to have a house and you have, a, have enough to have a, uh, a factory. Uh, those are the kind of things that uh, come from that basic precept of a uh, Say's Law that you first produce before you consume. And therefore, uh, when you look at uh, getting more people in a better position to do that sort of thing, you ask yourself the question on a political basis, that is, if you have a House of Commons and you want to improve the circumstances of the people in the Republic, uh, then you consider that kind of thing and you say, what policies would be better for people to be able to produce so that they can consume more? And so uh, that kind of thing uh, 
uh, becomes very important in the ideas of influencing the way the parliament works and the parliament's influence on the king and so forth. And uh, uh, in that kind of a milieu of determining that, we come up with a very significant idea that happened to be in the Wealth of Nations, reported by Adam Smith. But I would hasten to add that this is something that he observed by looking at a pen factory, a little producing facility uh, by a member of the middle class, uh, by someone who was making pens to be used by other people. Uh, that pen factory had discovered that uh, there was something uh, in making a pen, there was something uh, like uh, several dozen, as I recall, I, I've got it in my book, but uh, there were numerous tasks to be done, different tasks by the workmen to make a pen. And they had found by their own experimentation that if those tasks uh, were all done by the same person, which was the way they originally did it, every one of their workers could make about uh, a couple of dozen pens mm -hmm. in a day's work. The division uh, of labor. <laughs> yeah, but if they specialized and gave special uh, limited uh, duties on making that pen uh, to particular workers and other specialties to others and, and so forth and divided those into just certain duties, uh, they uh, produced thousands more pins, uh, not even on the same scale. Their production just went through the roof. Well, uh, that is extremely important to say that an academic didn't come up with the idea, he observed the idea uh, from the ordinary people doing these things and their experience. And then that came along and uh, obviously became apparent to people who decided later that they wanted to do things like building a car or building an automobile, uh, uh, a locomotive or things like that. You start specializing and do assembly lines and so forth. And, and that uh, and developed into this tremendous industrial revolution uh, that took off after 1815 and uh, made the world a very different place, although what we would call very, very rudimentary uh, in terms of the kinds of inventions and machines, but uh, in many respects, uh, a, a much more wonderful place, some would say even than we have now, uh, with all of the uh, kinds of monstrosities uh, that are produced uh, regularly in our current day society. Um, well, uh, so let's get to the point of um, uh, how that kind of development in productivity started influencing the legislatures. The legislatures uh, started looking at the idea, what laws would be effective in making our country more productive? In effect, so the king can have more gold. Uh, but this kind of thing is a pretty powerful argument when you uh, legislature is asking the king, uh, can we do these kinds of things? And uh, then uh, proceeding to do them. And in that circumstance, uh, you get a development of economic theory and a development of, of, uh, of uh, applicable law to economic activity, financial activity, marketing activity that is very conducive to increase productivity and uh, greater prosperity. Um, that was, that movement uh, was a development called uh, developing the theory of the firm. Uh, and uh, that is what classical economic theory was known as back then. Uh, it was called the theory of the firm. Uh, classical economics then began being taught at Cambridge to the leaders of uh, 
of uh, England, future leaders, and certainly to those who uh, influenced uh, those who went into manufacture and uh, production and things of that sort. Um, it essentially asked the question of what legislative or uh, legal principles ought to be enacted in such a way as to encourage people to be productive as opposed to getting in their way or just making certain people productive. And that whole thing became classical economics. Um, and uh, I, I go into uh, uh, that history in chapter one of my book uh, because um, initially I had promised in the preface that if you'll read chapter one, uh, Keynesianism will not be able to confuse you again. You'll be able to debunk what they're doing. Uh, Keynesian uh, economic theory still, still uh, c completely controls the uh, Federal Reserve uh, and uh, economic policy in the U.S. Uh, in large part. Uh, and it does so because we are, we remain under the capitalist or, or under the mercantilist boot. Um, and uh, uh, Keynes, I should add, was a professor at Cambridge. His father had taught classical economics his entire career at Cambridge, uh, was uh, a, a really mainstay of developing the kind of uh, uh, classical theory and uh, advising its use and so forth, influencing its adoption in the parliament. Um, so much so that, uh, that the middle class was greatly aided, uh, not just there, but in the US as well. And uh, there was a, a widespread belief in classical economic theory in the United States. Uh, but the John Maynard Keynes, the son of uh, the first professor of economics at Cambridge, um, first had uh, become a prominent himself. He had written a two volume work in about 1920 or so that uh, he thought was his uh, life's work, magnum opus, two volumes, uh, but it did nothing but get him in, uh, into a controversy with other professors at the time, academics, and uh, uh, but because of his influence at Cambridge, he was put in charge of the funds for the faculty and their the investments of the university, its endowment. Mm -hmm. And uh, he made money during the 1920s, uh, very possibly with connections in the financial world. But nevertheless, with that influence uh, and the influence from the other direction, uh, influence from the moneyed community, which were definitely mercantilists. In 1935, 36, he wrote another book uh, that uh, is the one that so-called uh, made him famous. Uh, but uh, uh, in that uh, in that book, he basically went to the dark side. Uh, the most noted authority in the world at that time on mercantilism was a Swedish economist uh, who had, uh, uh, who wrote a book about the same time about mercantilism, describing it. And uh, when he evaluated uh, the uh, Keynesian book, uh, he basically concluded at the time and said so in writing that Keynes had, uh, uh, was much more uh, sympathetic and supportive of the mercantilist ideas than uh, uh, Heckscher was, uh, the Swedish economist, Eli uh, Heckscher, I believe was the name. And uh, so in those circumstances, we basically uh, uh, have a circumstance in which the mercantilists once again came to the fore. Uh, they uplifted uh, Adam. Well, geez, I'm uh, losing my train of thought in terms of uh, the 
the writer of, uh, uh, of Keynes, John Maynard Keynes, made him a, uh, a star, uh, had as uh, Keynes stepped to the floor and started uh, supporting Roosevelt and what he was doing. Right. So that's the circumstance in which uh, we got to the uh, present day circumstances in which Keynes has still been made the uh, uh, the leading light of our economic policy today, which essentially is an approach that uh, is highly confusing. As I describe in my book, it's as if you're looking uh, at the economy from the big end of the telescope and uh, everything looks a lot farther away, a lot smaller, and much more complex, much more uh, difficult to deal with, uh, but very esoteric so that you can develop these theories about the way things will come out. But let me uh, just uh, wind up by saying uh, a very good example, present day, more or less uh, current, but let's just talk about uh, uh, 2008. Um, the simple matter of how the mortgage uh, crisis came to be in uh, 2008 uh, came about by a deliberate decision of the Federal Reserve uh, Board uh, to put um, uh, a large number of Americans out of work, supposedly in order to control inflation. Now, uh, the amount of uh, uh, capital, uh, new capital, the new money that was being created each year between 2000 and 2008, uh, the largest year by far was one in which they added $45 billion of new money into the economy. Uh, and uh, uh, and several of the years uh, were much less than that, uh, 25 billion at the most. And that was a time in which we were actually growing quite substantially uh, in terms of uh, uh, employment and so forth. And yet they decided uh, almost uh, unbelievably that, uh, oh, we're starting to see a little bit of inflation and they developed this theory and this uh, you know, public talk that, oh my goodness, house prices are going up. Uh, and uh, I, I think partly that was due to the Chinese uh, money starting to come in from all the uh, buying we were doing over there. But in any event, uh, they used what is known as the Phillips curve theory and I'll sum up the Phillips curve for you. If you put a lot of people out of work, they won't have a job, they won't have money, and they can't buy things. And so prices will not go up as fast. Uh, that's the Phillips curve, and that's exactly what the Federal Reserve did in 2007. Uh, they uh, raised interest rates so that uh, it immediately threw out uh, over a million people and it uh, kept on rising from there. People who had been prosperous with jobs uh, all of a sudden can't pay their mortgage. And so it, it then gave them the, the ability to um, very substantially manipulate the mortgage market to make it look as if there was a real crisis. They did that by, by using derivatives uh, that uh, enable them to attack uh, mortgage holders in such a way as to make it look like they were losing value. Uh, so that whole thing was an orchestrated thing that I described much more in my book. But again, uh, it is the, uh, uh, the kind of proof that not only the Fed, but Wall Street, and our government is completely dominated by mercantilist thinking and power today. Um, uh, even though, as I say, with the election of Trump of, uh, in 2016, it's my opinion 
that we have had a counter assault against the mercantilists, a, a counter assault against the royalty of uh, Europe, uh, and the powers that uh, have controlled that global cabal that uh, announced in uh, 1901 uh, that they uh, were intending to destroy capitalism, destroy the middle class, and return uh, completely to a uh, two-class system of rulers and uh, their servants. So I think that uh, pretty much sums up what we needed to talk about today. But uh, yep. please ask me if you like anything else or not. No, I think I think that's it's excellent. I think this is a great place to wind up. I hope that you are accurate in the counter assault. If it is taking place, I mean, I sure hope that that is the case. Um, I think you've, we've covered an awful lot of ground today, so I don't specifically have any questions. Um, I mean, we, you know, you, you laid a great historical, broad but uh, foundation for mercantilism, and um, moved into the basics of classical economics, and I think that's a, an, an excellent foundation. Well, great. Um, uh, I'll just say to wind up that uh, um, if you want to get my book, it's uh, on classicalcapital.com. Uh, it's $25 for the hardback, and that includes uh, shipping within the United States. So uh, it's uh, the most efficient way you can uh, uh, get at these, this information. I'm happy to summarize it in these ways. Uh, but uh, certainly a much more detailed understanding can be uh, gained by uh, going through that. And uh, it certainly contains much more than we can cover in any one particular uh, city. So sure. thank you for having me. You know, thank you, Wayne. I appreciate you, and I look forward to speaking with you again. And I must say that the book is a nice book, hardback, um, detailed, documented. You could tell there's an, there's an awful lot of work in that book. I mean, an awful lot of work. And well, I might uh, tell you that uh, it is uh, uh, sewn bound. In other words, the binding is uh, sewn the way they used to do when I was a boy, and, <laughs> and uh, maybe even when you were. Uh, but in any event, uh, uh, it doesn't come apart the, from the glue uh, breaking uh, uh, the way so many do these days. But it's important information, and I think it would be one. I'm not sure who else is going to write another one. Uh, to uh, uh, take its place or supplant it. And so you might want to keep this one for a long time. Uh, and that'll and, last a long time. I think that that book, it, it belongs in everyone's library. If you're a reader, if you're a student of history, if you have any interest in history and economic history, this uh, this book is a must-have. And it's almost shameful that uh, I think – don't misunderstand me, but I believe a lot of academicians today, they look at FDR as almost like their God or he's a demigod. And, and what we have been taught as truth concerning the Great Depression is um, disappointing. I think that there's much more truth in your work and your book. And I don't know uh, anywhere else that this information is contained or can be found. I don't know that it exists anywhere else. Well, believe it or not, I, uh, I am able to pick up, I was able to pick up uh, details of various kinds on, on matters such as FDR's uh, personality and so forth that uh, were definitely uh, reported in uh, previous works, but in just little skimpy details here and there and so forth that uh, would be regarded as, well, that's not really substantial or something sort, but you put them all together in a context that allows you to evaluate them. He was an elitist all the way through. I'll just give you a, a, a parting one little uh, <laughs> example. Uh, when he and uh, Eleanor were first married, uh, well, it wasn't just when they were first married, but uh, all through the time, uh, uh, up until his presidency at least, uh, uh, when they were first married, you know, she inherited much more than he did, but he inherited a vast uh, fortune himself in a trust. And uh, but uh, he had annual income from it. She did as well. Hers uh, was much larger than his. But together, I computed it back at the time I wrote the book. And uh, in 
in the purchasing power of gold in 2011, uh, their annual purchasing power was about uh, $800,000. Wow. Uh, of annual income at the time uh, they were in, uh, uh, in that situation. And yet, with that $800,000 a year to support them, they just couldn't make it. He was going uh, back to his mother, who was much wealthier, uh, and uh, she idolized him, I think, uh, uh, for whatever reason, but, but uh, she would uh, give him all of the extras that just made life worth living, uh, you know, such as building his, uh, his very substantial home up in Campobello, uh, which uh, his mother already had a very substantial home and compound up in Campobello, but uh, uh, Franklin just wanted to have one of his own. And uh, uh, those kind of things, he went to her his uh, entire life, uh, uh, time and again, uh, yachts, uh, whatever. And that was the kind of guy, and yet uh, he could present himself as a man of the people uh, and just looking out for the ordinary guy. Of course, of course. We'll save some of that for later. Yeah, you know, and I, I must add here, you know, just from observation, I haven't done any gold calculations or comparative, you know, uh, today's dollars compared to back then, but that seems to be about the, the going rate or the price of the uh, of the average water boy for the 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 global cabal, you know, about five to 800,000 a year. It seems to be about what they the uh, average water boy earns. That's just my comment. I'm throwing it in there. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Wayne. I've enjoyed it. I'm very informative as always. And Thank you, James. I look forward to talking with you again. Okay. Me too. Have a great day. Thanks. Thank you for joining us on the Banking with Life podcast. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure to like and subscribe and click on that little notification bell. Otherwise, join us on Apple Podcasts and Stitcher for weekly content.